the discussion. Uh, today we talk about non-native effects in uh, protein folding and uh, evolutionary switches. Uh, okay, so uh, here's a brief outline of what I'm going to uh, go over. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the relationship between non-native effects and this consistency or minimal frustration principle. We have been seeing a lot of this uh, structure-based model or gold line model, so, so how are we going to do that? So, so basically, the approach I'm going to show you is to, to use the, the structure-based model as a, as a basis, as a baseline, and then uh, treat the non-native interaction, sequence-dependent non-native action as a perturbation. Uh, then I'm going to show you a few examples that uh, we have done in our group. Uh, first is uh, FeedNetrix3 domain. Uh, so we are successful, I think, to uh, model the non-native hydrophobic interactions and the actual static effect in this protein. And then it's the top seven is the, the uh, protein designed by the David Baker group uh, quite, a, quite a number of years ago now, in 2003. Uh, supposedly at that time, this is a topology that's not in the PDB. And so they invented this topology. And the folding kinetic is uh, quite complicated in this model, it turns out. Uh, so um, we're going to use the same approach to see whether we can uh, understand why, why the kinetic is so complicated. And also we're going to extend the model, uh, this uh, molecular transfer model uh, studied by Dave Fermalai, and we're going to extend it so that it, it can be uh, used to treat non-native interactions. Then we're going to talk about IM7, IM9. This is also a, a pair of uh, uh, homologous, uh, famous, quite, quite well-recognized protein study a lot by the uh, Schinner Reference Group in England. And the interesting thing is they are, their structures are very similar and their sequences are more than 60% identical, but IM7 has a prominent uh, kinetic trap uh, or intermediate, but IM7, uh, IM9 doesn't. And so uh, we're going to use this, uh, the approach that I proposed, this so-called hybrid model approach, which is to use the, um, the structure-based model as a basis and um, the sequence-dependent interaction as a perturbation to see whether we can rationalize that. Then we're going to switch gear a bit and talk about protein evolution, uh, the perspective from simple exact models, and then let's talk about uh, extending the approach to, to look at how we can maybe understand conformational switches. Okay, so here's a uh, sort of a biased view of what, uh, my biased view of what was happening to, uh, what has been happening to uh, the physics of protein folding using uh, simple models, you know, physics approach. So. 1975 is an important year because that's the year that um, Go and his co-workers proposed this Go model uh, in a two-dimensional square lattice. Uh, so it's a Go model is a, what, what you call structure model today. Structure-based model today is basically only the, uh, the interactions in the target structure are favorable. All the other interactions are either neutral or repulsive. Actually, in the same year, uh, there's a first continuum cost grain model for protein folding published by uh, Levin Washo, and now, you know, this finally led to a Nobel Prize a few years ago. Okay, then fast forward 10 years, uh, 1985 is the year that Candil published the first paper on the mean field models of protein folding. So mean field of lattice model is based on the Forey Huggins theory, uh, just taking care of hydrophobic polar effect, and 1987, uh, is Springleson and Warren as spring gas models of protein, and 88 is, I think, around and Alain in France also follow up on the screen glass picture of protein folding. Uh, so 89 is the proposal of the HP model. The HP model has this, um, I mean, it's still alive today. And, and then in the 1990s, uh, early 1990s, people introduced other alphabets like three-letter models and then Eugene Shatton, which got um, 20 letters model. And by that time, because I've, I've sort of involved in the beginning since 1987, we thought that we we're going to get away from gold model altogether because now we got physics. We, we actually can take, can take care of the sequence in some simplified way so that we don't actually have to sort of why in the, the, the target structure because that's not quite physical in a way because it's not a transfer potential. But after a while, I think maybe not with the, a lot of people in the field admitting it, we realized that there's only so far that we can do with the what we believe to be the physical models because I think, from my, in my opinion, is we have not captured all the effects that we observe in uh, real proteins. The main thing that we didn't capture is the topic that I emphasized yesterday is cooperativity. We couldn't capture that using physical models. Uh, so, so it's a gradual revival of the goal line modeling, I think started in uh, um, 1998 uh, with uh, Jose Onochek and uh, Cecilia Clemente's 
off-lattice model which turned out to be very powerful structure-based model. Later on, people add in many body terms and then consider cooperativity. 2002, uh, again, um, uh, Jose and uh, Anhaus group uh, introduced the solvation barriers. And today is going to talk more emphasis on uh, this hybrid approach uh, that uh, we have done uh, a number of studies on. And even before 2008, there are a few studies that actually use a similar method, like uh, one of our organizers, Stephen Plokin, in uh, 2004 also have a method like that. But uh, in 2000, I think there's a more effort in actually putting in the actual amino acid sequence. Uh, but before, it, it was more like sort of putting in random non heaving action to see how it affects uh, the ruggedness of the energy landscape. Okay, so uh, starting with 2008, so, so this is, the, the philosophy of this is this. So, so from this uh, brief uh, historical review, my point of view is that we, we are sort of forced back into using gold line models. It's not really what we wish to do, but we were sort of forced into it. Um, it doesn't mean that we didn't learn a lot of things because even with the gold line model, once we actually make that assumption, there's a lot of things that are not non-trivial that we can get, get out of it, like kinetics and so on. But then you ask the question, the motivation for the gold line model is that evolution somehow minimizes frustration. And so evolution or, or somehow this kind of uh, natural design is just so complicated that we don't fully understand, so we have to put in this uh, gold line potential or structure-based potential. But we also have some notion about what physics should work, like hydrophobic effect and so on. That shouldn't depend on the target structure. And it's hard to believe that those are all washed away and we just have the uh, structure-based potential or we have to go to very complicated potential function that we are still struggling with now, even with the atomic potential function to capture those effects. So what I've been thinking for a long time is to add back some of this sequence-dependent effect as a perturbation on the structure-based model. So it is a practical approach because with a structure-based model, we can guarantee that the, the model would fall, but at the same time, we try to capture back a little bit of this effect. That's the main idea. So I, I want to do that for a long time, but uh, in a vacuum, it's quite meaningless because it's quite trivial, but then uh, an experimental colleague in, uh, in our department, Alan Davidson, he's looking at some protein called fin asterisk 3 domain, and it's very puzzling. I'm going to show you the result, and so, so we started this collaboration, and so this is the method, right? So the method is pretty simple. So we have a total energy. So this is the structure-based potential, we call it native-centric potential, and then we just add in some sort of potential like the HP hydrophobic polar potential. Here, kappa I, kappa J are the relative hydrophobicity of residual I and J. And so it has this uh, simple functional form. That means this thing is no longer structure-based. It's based on the sequence. So along the sequence, if you have a hydrophobic, you put in this thing. So they, they, they interact by this kappa I, kappa J. So as I mentioned before, uh, other groups have... Uh, explore this method as well, but this may be the, the uh, uh, beginning of uh, an effort to, to actually put in the sequences to look at this more closely. Okay, so here are a few examples that um, this method has been applied to study various proteins. So this is a uh, fin acid 3 domain. This, is, uh, this protein has been studied by uh, Kobe Levis group in, uh, at the Weizmann Institute and also uh, Elizabeth Beerings uh, in uh, Waterloo, and NTO9 is also studied by Kobe, and top seven, uh, we have studied this. Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list, it's just, uh, I just picked up these four examples in this uh, uh, review that we recently, uh, recently written up. Okay, so uh, fin SH3 domain. The structure is like this, it's a beta sheet protein, and it's, so we focus on this particular position, uh, N53. So this is uh, an exposed position. So the experimentalists found that this position is very special. If they mutate it to all 19 or 18 other types of amino acid, 
it turns out the folding rate increases. That means it folds faster when this site becoming more hydrophobic. Okay, so this is the result. Here's this delta G delta G dagger is just the, the barrier heights that they deduce from the folding rate from this kind of chevron plot. And here's uh, the measure of hydrophobicity. If it's more hydrophobic, this, the barrier is lower. That means fold faster. So this is puzzling. Why would actually mutating something to hydrophobic on an exposed site increase folding rate? So it must be some sort of a non-native effect because that thing, that position is not interacting with anything in the native structure. So we use this uh, very simple approach is having a, a structure-based go light model and then just put in this uh, hydrophobic sequence on top of it and, and then try to crank up artificially this uh, hydrophobic strength and see what happened. So it turns out that then we can simulate and get the folding rate. Uh, so by the way, this, is, uh, this, is study, this study is by the student at that time, um, Aras, Serena Avasar, and uh, Stefan Wallin in my group. So Stefan did this calculation, and it turned out, lo and behold, you know, 53 actually, the folding rate increases when you increase hydrophobicity. Whereas the other sites that we have studied, there's quite a number of them, didn't do much. So it seems that the model is working, at least at this level. And Stefan also looked at other site with this as a background. So we mutated that to a hydrophobic residues already, the position 53. And then we mutate some other site. And there's a diversity in, uh, in response to that. Some would fall faster, some would fall slower. OK, so obviously, position 53 is doing something quite special. So now the point is whether we can actually predict what is this 53 interacting with. So this is a true prediction because there's no experiment before we did this prediction. It's simple to do. Right? So we, 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 we have seen this many times now in this conference. So we get the free energy profile and it's just take a slice of this as the transition state. And then we just look at the contact map. Paul Whitford talked a lot about this. Look at the contact map. And then we crank this up from the position 53 from uh, Wealthy weak hydrophobic interaction to uh, a stronger one, 3.0. And then we see that there's this interaction that's coming up. That is, 53 is interacting with this part of the chain, which is the leucine, the leucine 3 and phenylalanine 4. So the model predicted that in the transition state, that means in the transition state, the position at 53 is interacting with two other hydrophobic residues. That's why when they interact, when they become, when 53 become more hydrophobic, this interaction is going to get stronger and that stabilizes the transition state and that's why the protein folds faster. Okay, so we have to prove this uh, using an experiment. And so um, Arash uh, did a series of experiments using this double mutant cycle, basically is probing whether uh, two positions are either interacting in a positive way or a negative way, and um, we were able to prove that indeed the third position, L3, and the 53 position, and the fourth position, phenylalanine, with the 53 position are actually interacting in a transition state. And there are other sites that's inter interacting with it in the transition state, but in the opposite direction. And this also corresponds to those mutations that we found that would actually slow down folding instead of speeding up folding here. So these numbers are not too big, but if we compare with the control, these are significant. Okay, so later on, we also extend this study to uh, electrostatic interaction. Now, we are also collaborating with uh, George Maratasi. So there's a bunch of mutants that uh, the experimentalists uh, study. Uh, you know, the phenetic uh, three domain is pretty negatively charged. So, they, so one way to study it to see, to look at the charge effect is to mutate the negative charge to D to K to, to lysine to neutralize it. And so this is the wild type. And when you mutate it one at a time or five at the same time, you're going to increase the folding rate because if it's 
overall negative charge is a, a general repulsion for it to collapse, and when you neutralize it, or getting it less charged, it's going to fall faster. So here we just plot out, we just use the same trick, use this kind of potential on top of the, on top of the uh, structure-based potential. So here is a uh, repulsive interaction, this is attractive interaction between different charges, opposite charges, this is repulsive interaction uh, between light charges. And then we can get the prediction of this barrier height and then compare it with uh, experiment and we got quite a good correlation. These other data points are alternative models that we use uh, shorter range interaction that doesn't look so much like a columbic interaction or we also charge up the histidine. So we, if we don't charge up the histidine and we use this long range interaction uh, denoted by the solid curves here, we get quite a good correlation. So this general hybrid approach can also account for this uh, charge dependence in the folding rate of thin SH3 domain. So most of the contact probability changes because the contact probabilities are going to change for the transition state in, in order to affect folding. It's mainly in the, uh, among the native contacts, but there are also some changes in the non-native contacts as well. Uh, I should mention that yesterday, uh, Vinicius also talked about uh, uh, much more extensive study uh, using a similar approach on other electrostatic effects. So this, this method, I think, is still quite powerful. There's many issues to be explored, as uh, Vinicius showed us yesterday. Okay, so uh, now we go to uh, top seven. Uh, so this, is, uh, this, is, this was a protein that was designed by the David Baker group in 2003, and this particular topology with two helices and a five beta sheet was not in the PDB database at that time. I think now people argue that there's something similar is, is already in the database, but at that time it's quite clear it was not. But they, it's quite a feat at that time. They got it designed by Rosetta, and then it got a X-ray crystal structure that looked exactly like what is predicted. Then the Bayer group actually looked at the kinetics of folding of this. I don't know what they expected. Maybe they expected that this thing would fold like a two-state like protein, but whatever. It came out to be highly complicated kinetics. So we decided to take a look at that. At first, using this sort of general concept of uh, minimal frustration being uh, a reward property and so on, I thought if we put in the goal model for the, for the top, for, for top seven, it actually would fold in a, in a simple way. Uh, the only reason why it didn't apply is just because it's a human design rather than a evolved, so we are not, not yet as good as evolution. So I thought that would be the conclusion of this exercise that I, I gave to uh, Dr. Chang, uh, who was a, a new postdoc at that time. Now she's an associate professor in China. But it turned out, you just plug in a goal model, it's already show that this top seven it's not like the other protein that we study. So this one, the black curve, is the common goal model without the dissolution barrier. You see, definitely it's not two state. It actually got this thing to be deepest minimum is actually in the middle. And you put in a dissolution barrier, it's a little bit, behave a little bit better, but still you, you, you got a minimum in the middle. Well, you put in non-native hydrophobic interaction that would just flatten out and for the, for the for the one with the dissolution barrier, it doesn't change that much. So what this said is that even the native topology of top seven is already hinting that this is not a protein that would easily be folding in a two-state-like manner. So maybe the topology itself is making it hard even, even if uh, there's many variations of the protein sequence, the uh, amino acid sequence that you would try, it would be hard to get top seven to fold in a two-state-like manner. Just to follow up on that logic, so we also look at a bunch of maybe um, 12 or so other proteins with a similar collection of secondary structure with two helices with four or five uh, beta, beta strands. And all of this in the database, and we apply the, the structure-based model with the dissolution barrier, 
all of them look like they are too stay. I mean, with a high barrier in between, it's only top seven. So, so this is not just because top seven is slightly longer, it's 19, uh, 90 residues long, or because of the, uh, the collection of semi structure, because all these others have the same, more or less the same collection of semi structure, but just the topologies are different. And they all behave better, at least at this level. Okay, so the next step is to try to rationalize the complicated uh, folding kinetics observed by experimentalists. So in many of these modeling, just having one model for one protein, I feel that it's not very meaningful because uh, we have to actually sometimes adjust the problem to get it to work. So just to make sure that we are capturing some real physics, we always need some sort of control. So here we are comparing top seven with another protein called S6, which is a quite similar collection of the same structure. There's two alpha helices. There's a four beta strands here, five beta strand here. Okay, so, uh, but S6 fold more cooperative than top seven in experiments. And also because of difference in topology, top seven and S6 have very different uh, relative contact order. Uh, top seven is much lower at around 11, the other uh, S6 is 19. Okay, now if we put in the desolvation barrier structure-based model plus this sequence-dependent hydrophobic effect, top seven looks like this, as I just showed you, but S6 looks something like that, so it has a high barrier in between. So they are different. So you would already see that this one might have complicated folding kinetics with an intermediate or something like that. This would have still a major barrier. Maybe it's more two-state-like. Okay, so here are the relevant experimental data. For top seven, you have a severe chevron rollover. This is only the folding arm. And the experimentalists resolve it into two phases. This is of a common practice in, uh, in looking at chevron plot. If it's not a single exponential, you try to resolve it into two or three exponentials. Uh, but for S6, it's a linear uh, chevron plot, although here they couldn't actually get it up to, uh, up to zero, but at least up to around one point something, it's still quite linear. Uh, one thing to note is that the midpoint folding rates of top seven is faster it's around 50 times faster than that of S6. So maybe by luck, we, sh we will be able to capture this effect as well. Okay, so these are the model Schreffron plot that we got out from our model. Uh, so this is not, we don't have an expli explicit model for the nature and concentration. So this is, this concentration is deduced by, the, by, by a proxy of using uh, native stability, so, so native stability as a function of guanidine chloride, guanidine hydrochloride is linear, so in the model we can also get the, uh, we can compute the stability and from that stability we map it onto uh, guanidine hydrochloride just to make a more direct comparison with experiment. Okay, so, so this is exactly the same model, I mean exactly the same modeling scheme that means exactly the same way of modeling the structure-based part of the model with a desolvation barrier, same desolvation barrier height, and then the same way of putting in the hydrophobic sequence according to the sequence of whether it's S6 or top seven. Okay, so you look at S6, there's not that much of a Schreffron rollover. Okay, by the way, these are, are black crosses are the experimental data, so the trend looks like the experimental data, not perfect, but you can see that this side, the, the simulated data points, like the red one, the green one, and so on, they are, they are not that curved. They are a little bit of rollover, but more or less still quite linear, at least around the transition midpoint. But if you, when you look at top seven, you see that if we just have the gold model, this DB means that it's just a structure-based model with desolvation barrier, but no non-native interaction. Then it curves a little bit, but it goes something like that. But once you put in this hydrophobic term, the sequence-dependent hydrophobicity, it has a severe chevron rollover. It more or less coincides with what is observed in the experiment. And furthermore, you can see that this, this thing at the, at the transition midpoint is around 50 times faster than the S6 transition midpoint folding rate. 
Okay, so we can also look at what are the what what are the structures that are causing this uh, slowdown and com complexity in the in top seven folding kinetics? So we can have this um, trajectories, and you always have okay. So 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 the red what the the black one is Q is the fractional number of native contacts, and the red one because there's a lot of non-native contacts in this model. So we also track the number of non-native contacts by the by the red. So when this is high, that means it's a non-native. Uh, high fraction of non-native contacts in the structure. Okay, so this is a transition midpoint of the Schaffron plot. You still got some sort of a kinetic intermediate. This structure looks something like this. This is not seriously trapped. This is because this part of the protein, the N-terminal part of the protein, is just flopping around. Because for top seven, maybe because of the design, uh, some other authors have also noticed this as well. This part would more or less fold independently of this part of the protein. So, so this one, you can see that there's not that much non-native contact, but this is nonetheless a folding intermediate. And in some other cases, when the conditions are strongly folding, according to, that correspond to what I call the lower denaturant concentration in the Schreffelin plot, you'd have structure that will high percentage of a non-native contact, and then you have structure like this that are pretty non-native. So this, like this, is sort of mispacking of the two helices. These are actually all kind of a bit messed up. So we can at least identify I0, I1, I2, at least three classes of these uh, kinetic traps. So again, these are the experimental data showing that the multiphasic uh, folding kinetics. And if we treat our data in the same way, that means we get the uh, mean first passage time, and they are not single exponential. I mean, when it's close to the denature, um, the transition midpoint is more or less single exponential, but when the condition for folding is getting stronger and stronger, we also got this uh, multiple exponential behavior. And if we resolve into two or three exponential, we will get a similar behavior as observed in experiments as well. Okay, so we, we also look at this uh, further and find that maybe a lot of this uh, kinetic trap is due to this long stretch of hydrophobic residues from 63 to 72. There are long, uh, a stretch of 10 residues, nine of them are hydrophobic. Probably it's this design in the top seven that's causing a lot of uh, this kinetic trap. Uh, from the experimental side, uh, in this paper, by uh, David Baker and Tobit Sosnick's group, they identify these residues as participating in non-native interactions. And I indicate them by this dotted line here, are these positions, 48, 63, and so on. And in our simulations, for the I1 and I2 intermediate, you can see that a lot of the non-native interactions are also coinciding with what is observed in experiments are all involving these residues. So these are the non-native interactions that are prominent in I1. These are those in prominence in I2. OK, so now let's switch gear to see whether this side chain model of uh, the thermite group can be extended to look at uh, non-native interactions. If you recall, I sh showed you this uh, yesterday. So the basic idea is that um, they have a side chain model, one bit for the Ciava and then one bit for the side chain. And then they have a structure based model, and then they have uh, another term that corresponds to the denaturance effect. And that, that uh, strength of that term depends on the exposure, the solvent accessible surface area, and the experimental transfer free energy. So it looks pretty realistic, but the setup of this model. Uh, as is commonly used by Dave's group, is in fact essentially a structure-based model, like a go light model. The reason why I'm saying that is because how it works is like this. This is the original setup. So, so it's a go model at zero denaturing concentration. So it's like this. So it's a non-native contact. I, okay, I put in this uh, dotted curve to, to indicate the SASA, the solvent accessible surface. So 
the model is only used to weaken contacts because the, the gold model is actually at the most favorable condition for folding. So when you add denaturants, you are going to weaken every contact. So the native contact is weakened. And the non-native contact, because the gold model is zero denaturant, so you add denaturant, it's going to be even more disfavor. So that's why I'm saying that the original setup of this uh, MTM is essentially a goal line model. Of course, it has the, the utility of being able to capture the, the uh, denaturant dependency effect in a more natural manner because we are using the SASA and also exponential transfer free energy. But this cannot give you a non-native effect. But if you think about it, you can reformulate a little bit and get it to do the non-native effect. The way to do it is uh, we proposed this in a paper in the PCCP in 2014. Instead of getting the baseline model as zero denaturant, we get the baseline model as some high denaturant concentration. And we, we adjust the thing and, and actually we have to do it at 15 molar, of course it's a hypothetical, guanine hydrochloride. So now this is the gold model is at a high denaturant concentration. Okay, now you go back to no denaturant concentration, you are going to strengthen the contact. So the native contact would get more favor, but the non-native contact would get less disfavor or favor as well. Because if we want to make full use of this transfer free energy and the denaturant dependence on it, that means if you have less denaturants, the things like two to leucine should attract each other more, right? So this formulation would capture this and allow non-native interaction to occur. Whereas in the original formulation, because you always weaken the, the interaction from the baseline model as zero denaturant, you're never going to get much of a non-native contact. Okay, if we do that, just, just as a, an exercise, we apply this uh, new formulation to the top seven protein if we use the original formulation, this is, yeah, we, we always have this kind of problem. I'm sorry, I think it's the, the, the Apple. It's a mismatch with the software. But anyway, so this is the, I think this means there's a subscript, right? So, so when Z0 is equal to zero molar, this is the original formulation. You don't get much of a rollover for the top seven. But if we, if we use the formulation that I just uh, described to you that we, get the baseline at a high denaturant concentration and then get back at no denaturant concentration, you can get this behavior, a severe Chevron rollover, that's quite similar to the, to the experimental data point of these, uh, the black uh, data points here. Okay, so uh, that's all I want to talk about, uh, top seven, and here we move to this uh, M7, M9 proteins. Okay, so you can look at the structure. They are very similar, right? So, uh, okay, so there's a color code here. Uh, use orange for big hydrophobics and uh, yellow for smaller hydrophobics. And then uh, M7 is, the, the rest for M7 is in black and for the, the rest of the residues in blue in M9. So we have about 60% sequence identity, but M7 populated transient folding intermediate at pH 7 and 10 degrees Celsius, whereas M9 under the same condition fall in a two-state like manner. So there's a, a lot of experiments done on this, uh, mostly by a Shin and Reference Group at uh, University of Leeds in England. And so it's a puzzle. How do we uh, understand this? Understand both of them at the same time. Okay, so here are the experimental data that I just mentioned. So for, so for M9, this is the folding arm. It's more or less linear. Of course, it's always some, some kind of trouble to get data here because things are just folding too fast. But definitely, this is different from M7, which has a, a clear Chevron rollover. Okay, so we uh, test three types of models on these two different proteins. One is just the DB model, desolvation barrier model, is just the structure-based goal line model, but we have desolvation barrier. We, all, we, we always try to put, put in a desolvation barrier because overall it makes the model more cooperative and more look like real proteins. 
And the other model is like the top seven model and the thin asterisk three domain model. We put in hydrophobic, but the hydrophobic strain for every hydrophobic is the same because that's just, just sort of our first attempt to capture the hydrophobic effect. And then we also test another one that's slightly more sophisticated that the leucine would have a stronger hydrophobic effect than alanine. In that case, we use the mia salvangelic and matrix, those energies, so that now we distinguish between different kinds of hydrophobic. So it's three classes of model applies to two proteins, and so the six models all together. And if you look at the um, free energy profile around the transition midpoint, they look more or less the same. I and mean, it's pretty cooperative. They look pretty much the same. It's not that much of a difference. Actually, it's a consistent experiment because from dynamically, they are quite similar. We got a little hint of that. There's something is going on here, but well, I mean, if you just look at this, you can see that's nothing, right? But if you look at it kinetically, look at the kinetic trajectory under strongly folding condition, they are very different. So for M7, you get this clear transient intermediate. So, so we populate that, come back, populate that, and then finally it folds. For M9, it regular a lot here, but it never have some sort of a clear intermediate, and then it would fold. So you plot out the, the conformations as a function of Q that are populated along this folding pathway, uh, this is the, the quantity I introduced yesterday. Basically, it's just you have a, a, a folding path. You, you sort of plot out this part of, the, of this trajectory, and you just take a log and plot it out. Because of this uh, kinetic trap, you get a big dip here around Q equals to 0.85, whereas in, for, for M9, you don't get that. So the model, exactly the same modeling scheme for two proteins, uh, same way of defining native contacts, same way of taking care of sequence-dependent hydrophobic effect, give very different results. So at least at this level, we can say that uh, we gain some physical understanding by, by modeling, because clearly this is capturing some of the effect that's, uh, that have been seen by experimentalists. OK, look at the Schaeffler plot. If you use the totally structure-based models, it's not that much of a difference. And even if you use the model with uh, uh, a uniform hydrophobic strength, you also see not that much of a difference. So that means the effect here we are seeking is more subtle than the other effects that we've been seeing in top seven and in fin asterisk three domain. The difference between M7 and M9, in order to capture that, you have to capture the difference between bigger hydrophobic and smaller hydrophobic. Okay, so, but when you put in this VSI and Jernigan, now we see that this is actually the effect that we saw here is a reflection of this, that M7 got a severe shelf on rollover, whereas M9 does not. So we capture the effect. Oh, let me be honest here. We don't capture every effect because from, an exper from real experiment, this whole thing should move up. Actually, this thing should fold faster than this. But, some, but this, thing should fold, no, this thing is folding faster. Is it faster? It's folding slower. Uh, Actually, this should experimentally, this whole M7 Schaeffer part should, should move up here. So we cannot capture that effect yet. This probably is also related to this thing that I told you about. We always have some problem with the Schaeffer part, even with the asymmetry and so on. I think this is all related. But at least at the level of whether they have a Schaeffer rollover, so severe Schaeffer rollover, we capture it. Okay, so we can look at that part of the the conformational space that actually got kinetic trapped for a while and look at the distribution of contacts in this contact map. So on this side, these are native contacts. On this side, th these are non-native contacts. So this is the structure of what we predicted to be the folding intermediate. And experimentally, from our reference group, they identified 10 residue to be heavily involved in non-native contacts. And it turns out, so, so I Again, as what I did before for uh, top seven, I marked them with this dotted line on this contact map. Again, nine out of 10 of these residues observed to be important for non-native contact by experimentalists are also 16 out of seven of the strongest non-native hydrophobic contacts in our model. So this should be a good prediction, we believe, to be the structure or the ensemble of structures of the transient intermediate observed in experiments. We also 
did a test to show that because what we have been using is a C alpha model, so there's a question of whether actually it could exist once you put in the, the, the side chain, maybe it will all screw up your structure, and it turns out that for that structure we can quite safely build a side chain around it and then it's still maintain the same backbone structure. Okay, so here are further tests on uh, many mutations and they are all compared using uh, this plot is uh, the plot of the, the folding path. And so we can rank order various mutations, whether they would create a deeper kinetic trap or a shallower kinetic trap. And so for this set of data, the experimental data, there's a lot of experimental data on kinetic folding weights, more or less agree with that, but not all of them. For example, for F41L, for us, it actually should have a deep kinetic trap but in reality, actually, we speed up folding. So there's some other things that we don't understand yet. But by and large, we capture the trend here. So here, there's no experimental data uh, on double mutants, but as well, we, we just simulated that in the future. Uh, people can look at that as well. Okay, so why is this uh, difference between IM7 and IM9? Well, we capture it, so, so it's all in the model, but conceptually, what is the main reason uh, it turned out, from our perspective, is because there's an interplay between the native contact density and the hydrophobicity of IM7 and IM9, mainly in Helix 2. In Helix 2, local native con contact density is much lower in IM7 than IM9. So what that means is that the native interaction are not holding Helix 2 that strongly together with the rest of the protein. But at the same time, the local hydrophobicity of helix 2 is higher in IM7 than IM9. So these are the contacts. So using either our way of defining contacts or another quite popular software, CSU, coming out from Israel for a long time, uh, of, of defining contact, we get more or less the same conclusion of this set of conclusions. So what it means is, as I just said, there are eight contacts in IM7 they are not in IM9, but there's 18 contacts in IM9, but not in IM7. So IM9, the helix 2 of IM9 are better tied down so that it's harder to get this order. At the same time, has less big hydrophobic residue, so it's also less incentive for it to get into non-native action to form favorable hydrophobic contacts. Whereas for IM7, first, the helix 2 is less tied down by by native interaction, at the same time, they got more hydrophobicity, so that what happens is, as I show you a few slides before, the helix 2 is getting uh, somewhat disordered and forming more hydrophobic contacts, and that's causing the kinetic trap and the difference in folding behavior between M7 and M9. Okay, so we also try to use uh, this uh, coordinate diffusion coefficient, dependent diffusion coefficient to capture this effect. Uh, in this case, for IM7, definitely we need a coordinate dependent diffusion coefficient because there's a huge kinetic trap here. So we basically use the method uh, proposed by uh, Witter and Jin Wang and, and use some kind of a uh, restraint potential and simulate and get, uh, oh, sorry, all these are all this L means uh, subscript. You can, you can translate that in your brain. Uh, so <laughs> it's to, to get the autocorrelation function and that all this machinery to try to estimate uh, coordinate dependent diffusion coefficient. So for M9, it's pretty flat. But for M7, as you would expect, at the, at the Q value around 0.85 where the kinetic trap is, the diffusion coefficient is getting much lower, one or two orders of magnitude lower, by using this method of autocorrelation function and all that. So this is just uh, showing this general method. Uh, we don't have time to go through this, but this is all standard. It's described in our paper and also in uh, in paper by uh, Witter. So we can also use this Kawasaki dynamics, just generalize it to uh, uh, coordinate dependence diffusion coefficient by just uh, using either uh, arithmetic uh, mean or geometric mean at the two uh, at the two values at the two sides at at, 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 at consecutive steps of the, the simulation. 
oh, this is bad. Uh, I mean, the, but anyway, so, so this is actually the general formula that gives you the, the integration of the diffusion, co uh, coordinate diffusion coefficient to get you the mean first passage time. And it's made famous in the protein folding field in this paper by Sochi and uh, Onuchek and Wolnitz. But look, I mean, in literature, actually, this formula was there maybe even earlier than this. This is the earliest I can find in a Russian paper in 1933. Anyway, so, so here is the, the result that I showed you already. And now we try to estimate what kind of uh, coordinate dependent and also stability dependent diffusion coefficient would give us this Chevron plot. This Chevron plot that we get from explicit training simulation. Okay, so this whole gray area is what is possible because the estimate is really not, we cannot be very certain because uh, things are varying a lot, but these are the area that is possible. So in order to get this Chevron plot, this diffusion coefficient at Q around 0.85, which is where the kinetic trap is, would have to depend on stability like this. So when the stability is higher, it's more negative, means it's more stable, the diffusion coefficient is getting smaller. So it's over more than one order, almost two orders of magnitude. It's this kind of variation of the diffusion coefficient around the kinetic trap would be needed to account for the severe chevron part we observe in the model. But even according to the way that we estimated the coordinate dependent diffusion coefficient and the stability dependence of this diffusion coefficient is within the possibility that we found. So it's okay. I mean, it's possible. That means it's possible to describe this severe chevron part with a strongly dependent, a strong dependence, stability dependence diffusion coefficient. I don't think this has been explored in protein system yet, so maybe we should do more on that to see whether, not even for M9, maybe for some other protein, what are the uh, coordinate dependent diffusion coefficient, which would also depend strongly on stability. Because as you, 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 you would imagine, when the overall stability is higher, everything is getting more sticky, and then diffusion is even, more, even slower because kinetic trap would be even more long-lived. Okay, so uh, summary of this part of the talk is the native topology likely place a constraint on the degrees of folding cooperativity achievable by design evolution, by, the, by evolution or by, by artificial design. For top seven, topology part is just not conducive to cooperative folding. So simple physics that we understand can be put back in as a perturbation even though we don't fully understand the full trans full potential, a full energy function for protein folding. So we put in the, the structure-based model as the basis so that we ensure that folding will occur, and on top of it, we put back in some physics, then we can learn quite a bit. And uh, common side-chain molecular transfer models, they are effectively structure-based model, but it can be reformulated at another baseline point to make it a model to describe non-native interaction. So for M7 and M9, the degree of kinetic trapping likely hinges on an interplay between native contact density and hydrophobicity. And in the example that I just showed you, if we have a highly coordinate dependent diffusion processes and also depends on stability, we may be able to use this kind of diffusion processes to describe folding with a se severe kinetic trap and chevron rollover. Okay, maybe I, I may run out of time a little bit. Hopefully it's okay now, right? I mean, it's still 10 minutes, but I got maybe 15 more minutes to go. Okay, protein evolution. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this. Why, why do I talk about protein evolution here? Because the, the method that I introduced about this uh, hybrid model can also to used to rationalize the switch between one structure to another structure. Okay, so these are just some general uh, remarks about protein evolution. We won't have time to go into that. The idea is there's two possible ways of evolving new structure. One is neo-functionalization. That means you start with a specialist, a particular protein at a certain point, there's gene duplication so that 
for one copy of the gene, you can preserve the old function, and then the other copy of the gene is free to evolve a new function, a new structure in our language. And, and another possibility is that the, the evolution actually started before the gene duplication because uh, an excited state of a protein, even though it's not the ground state, can also perform some function, and also subject to uh, evolutionary selection. So you can start with a generalist with two functions. At a certain point with gene duplication, they split out and they become specialists again. So there's some examples of this. This is not our own work. I just found this in the literature. Uh, Belinda Chan now is at the University of Toronto. Uh, so these authors reconstructed uh, some uh, fluorescent proteins in corals, some are emitting green light, some are emitting red light, so this is ancestral reconstruction. And they found that some of these putative ancestral proteins can emit both red light and green light, similar to actually you having uh, diversification in function already before gene duplication. So the basic idea is that uh, we have this idea of super funnel because each sequence is a funnel, then on sequence space, you also have a funnel. That's why we call them super funnel. And so this is, we started with a structure, then it would evolve into the other structure. So that's the general idea. And one interesting thing that, uh, if you are interested, please take a look at this uh, quite comprehensive review that we published a number of years ago. Why, the, why when you have some sequences, that could actually perform both functions. In the end, they would like to separate out into specialists, two specialists. It's not only because of intrinsic fitness, it's because of the topology of the sequence space. So these are the uh, sequence space network that we predict using a biophysical model using the two-dimensional lattice model, but it's based on HP potential. So it got biophysics in it. So it turns out that, as maybe you would expect in um, even before that um, those sequences that would perform two functions or actually have two native states are actually quite sparsely populated. So once you get these two functions, once you get a gene duplication, they would tend to spread out back into these two separate new, what we call neutral network because there's many more sequences that would actually have once one native structure rather than having two native structures. Okay, so this is a, a, a picture, uh, artist rendition of what's going on. You have these uh, super funnels, and then uh, super funnels are linked by some, some conformational switches, and this is an example that we are going to talk about. So there are only a few examples experimentally in the literature, uh, like this uh, T4 lysozyme. That means you, you do one mutation or two mu mutations, you switch from one native structure to another. So this is, what, this is by T4 lysozyme, it is uh, from Lewis Case group, and this is a much earlier example by uh, Bob Sauer's group in 2000, it's for art repressor. You do one mutation, it would become a sequence that actually have two more or less equally populated ground state structure, and do another mutation, it would switch to another structure. This is a dimer, and in this example, you can also make a two-step switch by mutation to a even different uh, organization of disulfide bonds. And here example by uh, Matt Cordes group. And, and so this is also a diamond. You, you need a, a lot of mutation, but you go from uh, also one structure to another. So the system that we're more interested in is this actually remarkable result coming from uh, University of Maryland. So you have a GA protein, which are three helix bundle, and then a GB protein is one helix and uh, four beta strands. And with many years of work, they find 27 mutations to get to this, what they, what they call GA, which still preserve this three helix bundle structure. And here's 21 mutations get to this structure, GB98. This 98 meaning that this pair has 98% of the residues are identical. Basically, it's different by just one residue. And then you have one mutation, leucine 40, 45 to tyrosine. We'll switch this one to that one. So, can we capture some of that using uh, physical models? So this is just a, a more detailed description of the system. This is actually the um, albumin 
uh, binding domain is a GA, and then the immunoglobulin binding domain is GB or protein G. And so here are 12 sequences. So this is GA. So this is the structure, and then you mutate, mutate, and up to this point, you switch to GB. So current force field cannot capture this. Uh, when Gunston uh, did a number of studies and concluded that current force field cannot capture this effect. Um, so we have been interested in this because of our interest uh, in uh, protein evolution with my collaborator, Eric von Bauer at uh, University of Münster in Germany. And so uh, Tobias Sikosak, well, former postdoc, and he's now working back in Germany, first used the Rosetta program to see whether we can capture this effect. Indeed, we could. So this is the GA, uh, sort of a, a pseudo-energy, is a rotated, ro rosetta skull. So GB actually is very unfavorable if you put in the GA, Y-type GA sequence, but when, of course, with the Y-type GB sequence, it's favorable. So it's, a, so it's a gradual change, and GA is the reverse, and here we actually can capture this switch point. But this is just using a single, uh, you're just looking at a single structure. But can we do this with an explicit chain model, um, what I call a self-contained polymer model? So to do that, we have to have a, to get to make sure that I can at least fold the two structure. We have a structural-based model as the basis. So, so we put in the native contacts for X structures because they, they all differ by a little bit. Uh, so there are eight structures available from NMR or X-ray crystallography and make sure that they can fold to all these X structures. And on top of it, we put in the the Pofasi uh, energy function, which is coming from uh, Lewin University, from uh, Anders Urbex group. So this is a bit busy, but the main point here is just to introduce these two coordinates. Uh, so this is QA, which is the fractional number of uh, native contacts in the A structure, this fractional number of native contacts in the, in, in the B structure. And so the free energy landscape looks something like that. This is the three helix bundle structure. This is the one, it's the one beta, sorry, one, one alpha plus four beta structure. Okay, so we just put in the transferable potential, the Pofasi potential. Of course, we don't get it to fold, and even the atomic potential couldn't get it to fold. So, so it's going to be something like that, all in this uh, low QA and low QB region. It's all unfolded. And if we put in the structure-based model only, if the, the native bias is weak, it doesn't fall. If we put in the strong native bias, well, it kind of falls to this, but then it got all kind of sort of intermediate structure in this region. It's also, this doesn't quite correspond to what is observed experimentally. Now, if we combine the two, we more or less capture the trend. Okay, so this is GA wild types, this is GB wild type that we march through all these sequences. So the fundamental structure-based model it is the same across these 12 sequences, but then we, because the sequences are changing, we just put in a different Pofasi potential according to the sequence, and then you can see from, this is GA wild type, so you have the native GA structure and then unfolded state of the GA and then you march through, then you started to develop something here, and when you have GA98 switch to GB98, these things become deeper on the B side, and then you go all the way back to GB wild type, then you have a native GB, and then the unfolded state. So the free energy looks something like this, so we were able to capture this effect. But one thing that is kind of of some interest because this is, uh, I got interested in this because of my work I talked about uh, last week um, on this intrinsically disordered protein. The aromatic interaction and pi interaction actually is underappreciated. And in this case too, probably is underappreciated because the most strongly interacting pair in this switch is, of course, the 45 position is mutated from leucine to tyrosine, and then the interaction is with this phenylalanine 52. Okay, so even in the Pofasi potential, which does not treat aromatic in any special way, it's just treat as just another nonpolar residue, another hyperbolic residue, this is still the most prominent interaction. 
But in fact, if you look at real chemistry, real physics, the aromatic interaction with this kind of geometry are actually quite strong. And so this is just a rudimentary attempt to put in some of this effect. It's not the full effect. So, so we try to put in some of this effect by looking at the database and the distribution of this geometry. And when, when we put it in, we get a little bit of improvement, so because this is just a first attempt, uh, that the transition between the GA98 to GB98 is getting a little bit sharper if we're putting in this effect. So this is something to think about uh, maybe when we develop further in this kind of models. Okay, so here's the summary of this part of my talk. So the hybrid approach of modern non-native effect can be generalized to look at these conformational switches. So because the profile basically, the profile uh, potential basically just take into a nonpolar interaction. So the nonpolar interaction hyperbolic effect is quite sufficient to account for a large part of this conformational switch but maybe not all the way because the switch is obviously, we see the switch, but it's not as, as sharp as what is observed in experiments. And one way to improve it probably is to treat our aromatic interaction better. But of course, there's many other effects that we should take into account. Maybe it's still a long way that can, we can fully so appreciate how this conformational switch happen uh, in the real system. So that's the end of my talk. And uh, thank you for your attention. Oh, I, I don't know. Is it? Only a bit over time. <laughs>